Hello dreamers, and welcome back to the second and final part of episode six, The Victim Blame Game. And as a warning to listeners, this episode contains adult content and descriptions of gun violence. Listener discretion is advised. Last week, we delved into the world of Bonnie Lee Bakley. We explored her lifelong exploitive activities her mail order scams, her various sham marriages, her identity theft and fraudulent check writing, and of course, her celebrity obsession. At the time of her death and since then, her family has spoken publicly of Bonnie very little. A few days after her death in the Los Angeles Times, her mother, Marjorie Carolyn, confirmed that it was indeed a fact that her daughter lived on the edge. She worried about her constantly. To her friends and family, Bonnie Lee told of all the intimate relationships that she had with celebrities. Then, in late 2000, she had finally let them all know that she had landed the Hollywood husband she had always wanted, Robert Blake. Compared to her, Bonnie's three siblings lived relatively mundane existences. Her sister Marjorie was a secretary in Dover, New Jersey. Her brother Joey worked in the construction industry in San Diego, California. And her half-brother Peter worked in the landscaping business back in Tennessee. But for Bonnie, it was evident from a very early age that she was determined to have more than the simple life and her family knew she would never settle for anything less than becoming rich and famous. As mentioned in part one, Bonnie was raised by her grandmother because of unspecified problems at home, but if I were to speculate, it was likely Bonnie's free-spiritedness and the lifestyle that she desired rubbed her parents the wrong way. She might have had more leeway under her grandmother's roof. When she decided to chase her dreams of fame and stardom by moving to New York, she told her mother that she would be studying under famous acting coach Lee Strasberg. Considered to be the father of method acting in America, the legendary Polish-born actor, director, and theater practitioner trained several generations of notable actors and actresses, including Dustin Hoffman, Anne Bancroft, James Dean, Marilyn Monroe, Jane Fonda, Paul Newman, and Al Pacino, among many others. Whether or not Bonnie actually trained under Strasberg, I could not confirm. She wasn't listed in any of his IMDb that I could see. According to Bonnie's sister, she had two goals in life. One was to be a famous actress, and the other was to marry a movie star. She was only ever able to achieve half of that dream, her sister remorsefully stated. Life can be hard, she says, speaking of Bonnie after her murder. She did tell her family at some point that she was achieving some levels of success in her acting career. She claimed to have earned a Screen Actors Guild card and that she briefly appeared in the 1986 film Nine and a Half Weeks. Neither one of these claims have been able to be confirmed. Her vigorous pursuit of celebrities really began to pick up steam in the 80s and continued until she finally married Robert Blake. Bonnie's siblings often made fun of her supposed relationships that she claimed to have had with various celebrities. But no matter where Bonnie was at or what she was doing, she was always generous, kind, compassionate and supportive of her family. She was always there for them whenever anyone needed help. Even if she didn't have the means, she somehow would figure out a way to help and she always came through. No matter where her travels or adventures took her, she made sure her family and her children were cared for. I do take slight issue with her extended absences from her children to chase these questionable money-making pursuits, but mostly I shrug and try to understand that she did what she needed to do. 
Bonnie left her children in the care of their father and completely supported everyone financially. There are a lot of moms and dads who don't even do that much, so I'm going to leave that alone. It's actually quite difficult to find an article anywhere online that speaks fondly of Bonnie. There are a few interviews over the years that her eldest daughter, Holly, has given to various publications. But as much as she expresses her sadness over her mother's death, it's quickly followed by the vitriol towards Robert Blake. But the fact that Bonnie Lee was a real person, a mother, a daughter, a sister and a friend, is not lost on me. I've done a great deal of soul searching over these past two weeks to try and figure a way to eloquently repaint the portrait the public has of Bonnie Lee, and I've really found myself at a loss as to what to say. I try to rationalize things or put things into perspective like telling myself, well, she never killed anybody. But that isn't exactly a measure of how we should judge the likability of a person. I mean, is the nicest thing I could think of to say about Bonnie Lee as a person is that she never killed anyone? There's got to be more. But she certainly didn't make the task of reframing her public persona an easy one. She was what she was, a con woman. There is one thing I do know for a fact. No matter who she was, or what she did, or whomever she wronged in life, Bonnie Lee most certainly did not deserve to be shot to death while sitting alone in a car after a dinner date with her husband. That's a fact that was lost as the days, weeks, months, and years that followed when her character was assassinated in the media and in court when that husband of hers was arrested a year after her death and charged with her murder. That husband is the now 83-year-old actor Robert Blake. Much of the United States was still feeling the effects of the Great Depression in 1933. James and Elizabeth Gubitosi were a young couple struggling to make it through. They had a song and dance vaudeville act, but James also worked as a die setter for a can manufacturer in order to support his growing family. Michael James Gubitosi, who later on became known to us as Robert Blake, was born on September 18, 1933, in Nutley, New Jersey, and he was the youngest of three children. However, in a 2011 interview, Blake stated that he is unsure of his exact date of birth, but he knows it was sometime in September or October. He became part of the Family Vaudeville Act in 1936 at the age of two and a half, with older brother James, and sister Joan. They were billed as the three little hillbillies. They would go out with their father to parks all around their town in New Jersey and perform and then pass around a hat for coins. Blake would later on say that he felt like an organ grinder's monkey dancing and performing for his father like this. Little Mickey's father is said to have ruled the family with an iron hand and his mother was described as an emotionless woman who simply obeyed her husband. He had dreams of making it big in the movie industry, so when Mickey was four years old, his father uprooted the family and moved 3,000 miles west to Hollywood, California. In the 1930s, Hollywood was booming. The Great Depression only increased the public's demand for entertainment, and the movie business was exploding. But little Mickey's father was only able to find work running a small hardware store. The only one in the family who was able to land any kind of work in the movie business was little Mickey. At the age of five, he was hired as an extra on the popular film series, The Little Rascals, and it wasn't long before he became a regular. Little Mickey was a pretty good actor. He knew his lines and memorized them well, he was smart and charismatic, and he could cry on cue. It was somewhat of a sad irony, the one who wanted so desperately to make it in the business, 
Mickey's father, James, came to resent the fact that Mickey had become such a good actor. He grew deeply bitter towards the boy and his growing success. He took his anger out on Mickey, and for Mickey, working the long hours on the set wasn't so much of a hardship. It became an escape for him. Acting was a way for him to be someone else, away from his father's abuse. When he would talk about his father, he would describe him as a mean son of a bitch who would do such things as make him eat off the floor and lock him in the closet. His father was an alcoholic, a violent alcoholic, who was abusive to everyone in the family. But it seems his anger and resentment was mostly directed towards young Mickey. There were times when Mickey's father would be kicked off of sound stages and out of the studios because his presence would cause Mickey to become so agitated and shaken up while working on set. Later on in life, he would struggle with a tremendous amount of regret over really never being able to experience a real childhood. His parents pushed him into working constantly to earn money for the family. In all, little Mickey spent four years on the Little Rascals and stepped up to landing bit parts in big MGM movies. MGM thought it would be a good idea and the right time to reinvent little Mickey as he transitioned on to bigger and better roles. So in 1940, little Mickey Gubatosi, at the age of seven, became Robert Blake. In his first major role under his new name, Bobby, he played a young orphan child who was adopted into an affluent home. He had no trouble adapting himself into this role as it likely is something he would have wished for himself in real life. The movie starred Donna Reed as his mother, and he would recall that being on the set of the movie, when Donna Reed embraced him as his adopted mother in the movie, it was really the first time he could remember being embraced by a mother figure. He could not ever recall a time being held like that by his own mother in his own real life. In fact, the first Christmas present Bobby ever received was from the director of that movie. The acting came so naturally to Bobby, it flowed easily for him because it would become his technique to create this surrogate kind of family for himself within the set of the movies he would be in, a world that he made all his own, and he shined in it. In 1948, he had a chance to work with one of his idols, Humphrey Bogart, in The Treasure of the Sierra Madre. And having opportunities to work with legendary actors like Bogie made Bobby fall in love with the craft of acting, even though he had been basically forced into it by his father. However, by the time Bobby reached his mid-teens, the work began to thin out for him. He was getting older, too old for the little kids' roles he'd been playing all these years, and still too young for the adult roles. Casting agents found it more and more challenging to find work for him. Life at home wasn't getting any easier, and Bobby decided that he had had enough. So at the age of 16, he left home, deciding that he never wanted to see either of his parents again. The only person he would keep in touch with over the years was his older sister, Joan. She understood what had gone on with him as a child. Even his relationship with his brother was strained. He never wanted to acknowledge the abuse that they had endured. He never wanted to talk about it. He sometimes even participated in it along with his father. His sister, on the other hand, validated everything that had gone on in the family and that meant something to young Bobby. Even his parents chose to be in denial of the dysfunction of the family, but not his sister. She knew the things that they had gone through as children, and she wasn't going to just sweep it under the rug. Bobby needed that reassurance from her, so they remained close. Living on his own was tough for the now teenage Bobby. He dropped in and out of different high schools, 
finally graduating from Hamilton High School. He also started drinking pretty heavily. Uncertain of what direction he was going to go in life after high school, he decided to join the United States Army in 1950. He was a sergeant assigned to special services, stationed in Anchorage, Alaska. He helped set up performances, directed plays, and entertained the troops, but he disliked the regimentation of the Army. He continued to drink and even started dabbling in drug use. Around the same time, he fell in love for the first time with a 16-year-old girl, and before he knew it, charges of statutory rape were being brought against him. And it looked as though Sergeant Blake was going to be in some very serious trouble. But a Catholic priest, along with the girl's father, interceded and somehow they were able to work it out so that he was transferred back to the mainland United States and discharged from the army without any blemishes on his record. After his time in the army, Bobby returned to Southern California. He decided to try to get back into acting and attended Jeff Corey's acting workshop. His intentions were to improve upon not only his professional life as an actor, but also his personal life. He started to get bit parts in movies and slowly but surely he began to make a name for himself. He eventually was able to become quite the seasoned Hollywood actor playing notable dramatic roles in movies and on television. In 1966, he was billed as Robert Blake for the very first time. Into the early 1960s, however, despite his on-screen successes, in private, he was continuing his heavy drinking. He even began using heroin. But he continued to press forward in his acting career, which was continuing to go quite well. Robert's personal life took a turn for the better as well when he married actress Sandra Kerr in 1961. She was everything in life that Robert wasn't. She was a calm and stabilizing influence. As the story goes, Sandra was starring in a play and Robert saw her performing. For him, it was love at first sight. Robert credits him being able to give up drinking and the drugs to his marriage, as well as the birth of his two children with Sandra, Noah and Delina. Robert made a remarkable recovery from the throes of drug and alcohol addiction thanks to a good marriage, a couple of beautiful kids, some good therapy, and a rising sense of his own self-worth as a good actor. Settling down into family life was not cramping his style as a promising, versatile actor. He was getting more and more recognition for his work, and soon he would be auditioning for a role that he would become famous for, 1967's In Cold Blood. Based on a true story by best-selling author Truman Capote, it was about a brutal murder that took place in Kansas. Director Richard Brooks knew Robert had what it was going to take to play the role of one of the killers. In Cold Blood was a chilling look into the psychological makeup of two murderers. Robert played Perry Smith, a convict on parole who was brutalized by his father, who ends up taking out his revenge on an innocent family. Robert, with his own personal tumultuous family background, was able to easily identify with this character. The role was basically perfect for him. At the time, Robert's performance in the film In Cold Blood came to be remembered as one of the most memorable performances in film history. Anyone who experienced it could feel Robert's pain was authentic. You literally could feel it. He was so good at playing these types of characters on television and in film. There were a lot of actors who did not want to showcase their darker side. They'd rather put forth work that demonstrated them as heroes or someone to be admired by the audience. It took a confident, courageous actor 
To be willing to show the darker side of human nature during that period of time in television and in film. As Robert continued to draw upon his own turbulent and abusive childhood and channeling those memories into his characters while he was working, he was making sure his own children would have memories that would be very, very different from his own. While he was working, he was always calling home. He was constantly talking about his children and gushing about them to anyone who would listen. He was a very devoted father. He also wanted his children to have a normal life with a normal upbringing, quite the opposite of his own experience. He did everything he could to be a normal dad, not Robert Blake, the Hollywood movie star. Because of his stellar performance in In Cold Blood, he was suddenly one of the hottest, most sought after actors in Hollywood. But he didn't always make the right decisions when it came to the roles that he chose. He was called upon to take on a starring role in Midnight Cowboy, which went on to make Dustin Hoffman and John Voight famous. But Robert never even bothered to return the call. Subsequently, Robert's next four films did only moderately well in the box office. The irony is, what ended up being the role that made him a star in In Cold Blood, that role that was so well done and so well received, it was almost as if Robert had peaked at that point. He was so memorable that, unfortunately, that's all anyone could see him as from that point forward, that dark character from that movie. He was somewhat typecasted. His best role turned out to be almost a curse for him. Frustrated by the moderate success of the movies he starred in after In Cold Blood, Robert decided it was time to turn his sights elsewhere, towards television. In 1974, he was offered the starring role in a new television series, and soon he would be recognized for a completely different kind of role, a cocky cop named Beretta, a rough and tumble detective with a trademark pet cockatoo. It would be a risk for Robert, however. Going from the movies to television wasn't the sort of career moves actors usually made. Television was kind of the place for B actors while the A actors were in the movies. But being on Beretta offered Robert a certain level of control on the set that he never had before in the movies. He had a lot more to say in the production, direction, script, the actors and writers that were brought in. Beretta not only gave Robert more say in the production of the show, he was also able to develop his character in the way that he wanted it to be, infusing much more of himself into the TV character, so it was easier for him to just be himself on the set. The show also made him a lot more money than he had ever made before, and he was able to spend more time with his family and his children. In his first year as Beretta, Robert won an Emmy for Outstanding Lead Actor in a Drama Series. But as the success of Beretta grew, Robert himself came to develop a reputation of being increasingly difficult to work with. If he didn't like an actor that was hired for the show, he would make it known to everyone that he did not like that person. If he did not like the director, he'd say he'd want him out and he never wanted to see him again. Robert's unhappiness with the cast and crew began to spill over onto everyone on the set. For some reason, no matter how well the show was doing in the ratings, Robert was unable to take it for what it was and just go with it. He either could not or would not appreciate it for the success that it had become. People who worked with him could see that he just couldn't accept the success. His anger and resentment was overpowering, and it was difficult to understand how or why Robert's attitude towards the successful show was like this, except that possibly it had something to do with 
residual feelings of bitterness dating back to his childhood. In 1978, with slipping ratings, Beretta went off the air. Many felt Robert was mostly responsible for the cancellation of the show, as he had begun publicly badmouthing the show. That same year, his marriage to Sandra began to suffer as well. They fought viciously, separating for a time, getting back together, seeking counseling, trying as best they could to make things work. Robert also tried to get focus back into his acting career by delving back into roles on the big screen. But the two movies he made in a row, both in 1981, failed at the box office. His hopes of reviving his movie career were, for now, dashed. And again, hearkening back to his role in, in Cold Blood, it was just a performance so outstanding that Robert would never be able to match that again in his career. If he wanted to keep working, he was going to have to go back into television. Even though he had burned some bridges in the Beretta years, TV was more than happy to have Robert back. This time around, it wasn't going to be a television series, but rather made for TV movies. Even though his career started to pick up traction again, his marriage continued to suffer. And after a few years of reconciliation and counseling, the marriage ended in 1982. But Robert kept moving forward with the television movies. In 1984, he starred in Blood Feud, a miniseries about Jimmy Hoffa, the late president of the Teamsters Union. The level of intensity Robert brought to his character as Hoffa was reminiscent of his role in, in Cold Blood. He brought back that level of energy and delivered a riveting performance. He still had what it took to be a force in television. So he went on to develop his own series called Helltown, where he'd play a priest that tried to save lost souls on the streets of Los Angeles. The show was his baby. It was something he had been wanting to do for a very long time. It went on the air in 1985 and it found an audience, but 16 episodes in, Robert himself was the one who pulled the plug on the show. He had said that he couldn't stand the pressure of the production, the acting, the directing. It had all become more than he could handle. It was too much, too exhausting. This would be another one of those times where Robert was unable to find a way to enjoy his own success. Those who knew him could see that he was his own worst enemy. As much as he was able to advance in his own way, he stood in his own way at the same time. Around that same time Robert was about to walk away from Helltown, he was struggling with the deep personal loss, his sister Joan who he had remained close to all these years. She was dying of cancer at the young age of 53. When he found out she was sick, he flew her down to live with him in Southern California and did everything that he could to provide for her the best cancer treatments available at the time. But Joan would pass away in 1986, a loss that devastated Robert. He slipped into a deep depression compounded by worries, pressure, as well as drinking and drug use. He was reaching one of the lowest points in his life following the death of his beloved sister. Searching for something, anything to keep him wanting to move forward from all of this, Robert decided that one way to move forward was to get involved in political activism. In the spring of 1986, he joined other celebrities in a coast-to-coast -coast march for nuclear disarmament. While celebrities often showed up, lent their names, and then left, Robert stayed. He kept marching. From coast to coast, he threw himself into the protest for the duration. And an amazing thing began to happen for him. People were constantly coming up to him complete strangers 
who were always telling him how much they loved him and loved his work, even his work as far back as the little rascals. He would later go on to say that these encounters he had with people he was protesting with in 1986 were the ones who saved his life. It was the kind of praise, the simple praises, the ones that were unsolicited, the ones that were from the heart, the ones that he never got from his mother and father when he was a boy that truly moved him. When he returned home from his cross-country nuclear disarmament protesting, he threw himself into intense psychotherapy in order to deal with residual issues he had from the abuses of his childhood. The people around him began to notice a change in him almost right away. His home went from very dark colors to very light colors. He completely remodeled his house and made it more vivid and inviting. His whole life was lightening up. At the same time, he decided to take time off from acting. He stayed away from the big screen for more than five years while he worked on making himself better. Robert would eventually work again and he would also marry again. In 1992, Robert would make his way back to film. He did have to deal with the fact that the last time he worked, he had walked out on his own television show, Helltown. So he was desperate for something, anything to come along that he could throw himself into 100%. But he did so, making a deal for himself with producers. He said that he would do any role for free and when it was done, they could pay him what they felt he was worth. His next role, he would play a real life character as sinister as any he had ever played. It's a character I'm sure that many of you who have been longtime podcast listeners have heard of. John List, the man who killed his entire family, went on the run, changed his identity, remarried, and remained at large for 17 years. List's real-life childhood had been eerily similar to Robert's, filled with parental abuse, and as Robert promoted the film, he played up the similarities in their upbringings. This was the first time Robert would openly talk about the sordid details of his past and the abuse that he had endured his father who severely mistreated him, his older brother who joined in, his mother who allowed it all to happen. Robert had never been so candid publicly before about his past. He credited having gone through intensive therapy that he was able to talk about this part of his life. By 1993, he would say that he was finally, truly happy. By the late 90s, he was getting up into his mid-60s, so he was gearing up to settle down and start taking it easy. He went into somewhat of a semi-retirement. It was going to be a time for Robert to begin to slow down and start enjoying his life. However, Robert's semi-retired, relaxing, simple life suddenly became very complicated when he met Bonnie Lee Bakley in a nightclub in 1999. As we had talked about earlier and in the last episode, Bonnie Lee had been seeking out celebrities to attach herself to. The two struck up a relationship and began dating. Robert wasn't the only person Bonnie Lee was involved with at this time. She had also been seeing Christian Brando, and in the fall of 1999, Bonnie Lee became pregnant with her fourth child. When the baby girl was born in June of 2000, Bonnie named her Christian Shannon Brando. But a DNA test would later prove that Robert was indeed the father, not Christian Brando. The baby was renamed Rose Lenore Sophia Blake. And in November of 2000, Robert decided to marry Bonnie Lee. 
Friends of Robert would say that he was a very traditional man and that he was trying to do the right thing by marrying the mother of his child and raising her together as a family. It was turning out to be a very awkward situation for Robert as his friends and family were certain that he really wasn't in love with Bonnie Lee and really didn't want to marry her but felt so strongly that it was the right thing to do for his newborn daughter. He thought maybe things would work themselves out over time. The couple were so distant emotionally that the two didn't even live together. Bonnie Lee lived with the baby in a guest house on Robert's property. Following the questionable paternity of their daughter, Robert grew distrustful of Bonnie. At some point, he hired a private investigator to go digging into Bonnie's past so he could find out as much as he could about her to see if there was anything she was hiding. He discovered the many years of frauds, scams, and identity thefts that Bonnie had been involved in in the past and was continuing to be involved with while she was married to him. On the evening of May 4, 2001, Robert and Bonnie Lee dined together at Vitello's, a local Italian restaurant in Studio City, California. It was one of Robert's favorite places for years, and he'd even had a dish named after him on the menu. After they dined, the two walked to Robert's car, which was parked on a side street about a block away. Robert claims that once they arrived at the car, he had realized he left his gun in the booth back at the restaurant. So he left Bonnie at the car to retrieve the weapon. And while he was gone, at some point in the block and a half it took him to walk back to the restaurant, find the gun, and drink a glass of water at the bar, Bonnie was murdered. He returned to the car to find her lifeless, shot once in the right cheek and once in the shoulder. Robert ran to a nearby house and frantically asked, someone to call 911. The paramedics arrived, but they were never able to revive her. She was pronounced dead at the hospital at 10.15 p.m. Bonnie Lee was 44 years old. Because of the nature of Robert and Bonnie's relationship, the fact that they were married for such a short time the fact that they weren't living together, that Robert had dug up some dirt about her past, and it was common knowledge that their relationship was strained at best, Robert immediately became a suspect in Bonnie Lee's death, especially in the eyes of Bonnie Lee's family. It was common knowledge that Robert was deeply in love with his baby daughter but it was also common knowledge that Robert was not fond of Bonnie and was looking for ways to get out of the relationship. At the onset of the investigation, however, all of the evidence pointed in the direction of Robert as a suspect was all circumstantial. So the Los Angeles Police Department hesitated to publicly accuse Robert of having anything to do with Bonnie Lee's murder. As the Blake family buried Bonnie Lee and prepared to move forward in raising Baby Rose without her mom, the LAPD began digging deep into the relationship between Robert and his wife. Investigators soon discovered that Bonnie Lee had a long history as a scam artist, reportedly bilking money from lonely men, even marrying for money. One of her marriages to William Weber lasted for one week and when it was annulled, she walked away with $80,000. Believing that Robert was feeling trapped in his marriage and citing Bonnie's possible intentions of bilking him for money by way of marriage as being a motive for the murder, after almost a year of investigating, police made a stunning move. On April 18, 2002, they arrested Robert for the murder of Bonnie Lee. He was charged with murder 
and with special circumstances, this could mean the death penalty in California. Robert pleaded not guilty, and the then 68-year-old actor was ordered held without bail and was sent to solitary confinement to occupy the same exact L.A. County jail cell that O.J. Simpson had once occupied. For most of the following year, his lawyers worked feverishly to prepare for trial, and the media was having a field day with the newest celebrity trial. Robert's friends rallied together behind him, telling the media not to confuse the on-screen tough guy we've all come to know over the years, that that was all characters Robert pretended to be. The media was using old sound bites of a tough, aggressive-sounding Robert from his old film reels and was painting quite the negative picture of him in the media. At the same time, reports about Bonnie Lee's background as a grifter, a scam artist, and a lonely heart swindler began to make the media rounds as well. As unflattering as Robert's public image was made out to be by the media, just as bad, if not worse, was the portrait painted of Bonnie Lee. Sadly, the murder victim in this sordid tale was being assailed in the media. In March of 2003, the prosecutors presented their case at a preliminary hearing against Robert. Several former stuntmen had come forward to say that Robert had approached them and asked them if they could help him kill his wife, a shocking blow to Robert's case. The judge ruled that there was enough evidence to move forward with Robert to be made to stand trial for the murder of Bonnie Lee. Surprisingly, Robert was also granted bail. He posted bail later that day and went home. In a lifetime of personal triumphs and comebacks, Robert was readying himself for one more, to try and beat this murder charge. The case against Robert went to trial in December of 2004. The detectives and prosecutors struggled to find hard forensic evidence against Robert. There was no significant amount of gunshot residue found on his person. There were no witnesses that saw Robert as the shooter. And there was no connection between Robert and the gun that was used to kill Bonnie. They had the murder weapon, a Walther P38 9mm pistol, which was discovered the next morning in a dumpster near the crime scene. A firearms expert would testify that the gun was a standard issue for the German army during World War II, and based on its particular markings, it was manufactured in 1944. The Walther P38 was covered in dirt when detectives found it in the dumpster. Prosecutors say the gun was also covered in an unidentifiable oily substance, which could not be found on Blake or in his car. A forensic print specialist testified that they were unable to recover a single print from the gun or its magazine. Detectives were also unable to link the gun's serial numbers to Robert. The actor was carrying a licensed 38 Special Smith & Wesson revolver on the night of the shooting, the one that he had forgotten in the booth of Vitello's and left Bonnie in the car alone to go retrieve it. This small window of time would be Robert's alibi. Prosecutors would say that Robert's alibi doesn't make any sense. They questioned that if he had already been in the car and had the keys in the ignition when he realized that he had forgotten his gun, then why didn't he just drive back to Vitello's to pick it up rather than walk the block and a half, leaving Bonnie alone in the car? The defense would say it was simply because Robert prefers to walk. Prosecutors would also point out at trial that Bonnie Lee's passenger side window was rolled down, which was an indication that whoever approached the car, it was someone that Bonnie Lee was familiar with. And in the prosecution's theory of events, that someone was Robert Blake himself. They surmised that the veteran actor could not convince two former stuntmen to murder his wife, so he had decided to pull the trigger himself. According to witness testimony, 
Robert's credit card was swiped at Vitello's at 9.23 p.m. Robert was seen leaving the restaurant shortly before 9.30, presumably with Bonnie Lee. Robert claims that he walked Bonnie Lee to the car, and that is when he realized he forgot his gun in the booth back at the restaurant. The 911 call came in at 9.40. Robert claims that Bonnie was shot to death during the time it took him to walk the block and a half from his car back to the restaurant to retrieve his gun. However, there were no witnesses or waitstaff that saw Robert return to Vitello's as he claimed. Photographs from inside Vitello's show that the vantage point from the kitchen to where Robert had said he'd come back in to retrieve his gun and went back out again was largely obstructed by a narrow hallway. It was possible, according to the defense, for Robert to have come back in and leave again undetected. Neighbor Sean Stanick, the person who made the 911 call, testified at trial that Robert banged on his door, yelling, you gotta help me, they beat her up, somebody mugged us or something. A paramedic who responded to the scene testified that when he arrived, he found that Bonnie Lee was bleeding profusely and was unresponsive. She was pronounced dead at the hospital at 10.15 p.m. Several witnesses were called to testify as to Robert's behavior the evening of Bonnie's murder. Some of them claimed that his crying appeared to be forced, lacking any amount of tears or moisture around his eyes and face. But others would testify that Robert was visibly shaken, vomiting, and appeared to be quite hysterical. The night of Bonnie's murder, Robert's hands were swabbed and he tested positive for five consistent particles of gunshot residue. But the state's own gunshot residue experts testified that those particles could have very well come from Robert's handling of his own revolver that evening. The prosecution suggested that Robert may have likely rubbed the gunshot residue off of his hands by touching other items such as his head, his shirt, or the grass, all of which Robert was photographed doing at the scene the night of the killing. Prosecutors also presented at trial a seemingly suspicious note found in the car of Earl Caldwell, a handyman and bodyguard of Robert's, who had also been arrested and charged along with Robert as a co-conspirator in the murder of Bonnie Lee. On the note, a picture of which I will post on social media after this episode uploads, there is a list of items which could either be a normal list for a handyman or a list of things needed to get rid of a body. Two shovels, small sledge, crowbar, 25 auto, the words get blank gun ready, old rugs, duct tape, Drano, pool acid, lye, and plant. Prosecutors would say, it's a list of items needed to kill Bonnie and bury her body. The defense claimed, it's only a list of tools and cleaning products Caldwell needed to tend to Robert's home. And that 25 auto was a reminder to get his oil changed at 25,000 miles. The so-called murder list detectives found in Caldwell's car was nothing more than a handyman's shopping list, the defense says. Robert's workshop contained a slew of tools and implements that he and Caldwell used on odd jobs and remodeling projects all around the actor's house, pictures of which were presented at trial. These pictures show extensive remodeling being done at the actor's house at the time of his arrest for Bonnie's murder. There were also pictures of pool supplies, black duct tape, and Drano on the shelves in Robert's workshop. There were also exposed wooden beams wrapped in old rugs in order to keep them safe for baby Rosie when she was toddling around the house to keep her from hurting herself. 
Pictures of those carpeted, wrapped beams were also shown at trial. Murder and conspiracy charges against Caldwell were ultimately dropped due to a lack of evidence. Caldwell would go on to invoke his Fifth Amendment right to not testify at trial against Robert. Prosecutors had two key witnesses to bolster their case against Robert, stuntman Ronald Hamilton and Gary McLarty. Both came forward claiming to have information about the murder and testified at trial that Robert tried to hire them to kill Bonnie Lee. During the trial, Gary McLarty claimed that in March of 2001, Blake attempted to contract him to murder his wife. He allegedly declined. McLarty's testimony was subject to intense cross-examination, which brought up to the court his history of mental problems and difficulty remembering key details of the alleged contract offer from Robert. The testimony of Ronald Hamilton was also presented at trial. He also claimed that Blake tried to solicit him to murder his wife. His testimony too was called into question during cross-examination when his record of past convictions for various petty crimes, including drug and gun possession, was exposed. The defense had also brought forth some relatives of McLarty who contradicted parts of the prosecution's case. The jury also heard testimony about the long-term effects of chronic drug use that could have possibly had an effect on Hamilton's and McLarty's cognitive abilities, both of whom were heavy drug users during their careers as stuntmen. With all of this, the prosecution laid out its case against Robert. And what was their theory of motive? They built their case on the theory that the marriage between Robert and Bonnie Lee was shaky at best, and that he killed her to avoid having to go through the process of a divorce to free himself of a loveless marriage, that this was the answer to murder Bonnie Lee. The defense built their case on the lack of evidence against Robert, the minimal gunshot residue found on him, the fact that there were no witnesses, that Robert himself was now an innocent victim of circumstantial and fabricated evidence. Robert did not testify in his own defense. The defense also took the chance to assail Bonnie's character at trial. It was a tactic utilized in order to put forth an alternative scenario as to who may have wanted Bonnie Lee dead. They went on to point out all of the people over the years that Bonnie Lee had wronged the bilking of money, the sham marriages, the identity thefts, all of the people over the years that Bonnie Lee could have possibly made so angry that any one of them could have had it in for her, up to and including Christian Brando, the person she most recently claimed was the father of her youngest child, the one she named him after. When it was found out that he was, in fact, not the father, could this have pushed him to want Bonnie Lee dead? He had killed out of emotion and rage previously. Could he have done it again? Possibly. And it may have proven to be just enough to plant the standard of reasonable doubt in the minds of jurors. The murder victim, the person who was sitting in the passenger seat of that car, waiting for her husband to come back from the restaurant they just dined at to take her home who was shot to death in the head and in the shoulder. The true victim in all of this was being put on trial herself for her own unsavory behavior in life, none of which did she ever deserve to die for. She was not only re-victimized in the trial, but in the media who had had a field day with her sordid past a past that easily overshadowed any misgivings anyone had about the past of the man who was on trial for her murder. I can only imagine how saddened and hurt Bonnie's family, especially her adult children were, to not only have lost her in such a violent, senseless manner, but to see her character pummeled in court in an effort to save the man who they believed was responsible for her death. And with that, 
the defense rested its case on February 23, 2005. Closing arguments were made over two days on March 2nd and 3rd. The jury retired to deliberate on March 4th. They returned with their verdict on March 16th. The jury found Robert Blake not guilty of the murder and not guilty of one of the two counts of solicitation of murder. The other count, the solicitation of McLarty, was dropped after it was revealed that the jury was deadlocked 11 to 1 in favor of acquittal. Los Angeles County District Attorney at the time, Stephen Cooley, commented to the media on the verdict of not guilty by calling Robert Blake a miserable human being and that the jurors were incredibly stupid to fall for the defense of his attorney's claims. Robert's defense team responded to the comments by pointing out that the prosecution simply did not prove their case. Public opinion on the case, it was mixed. Some felt Robert was guilty and got away with it. But there was also the feeling that there simply wasn't enough forensic evidence to convict him. On the evening that Robert was found not guilty of murdering his wife, several fans celebrated the acquittal at Robert's favorite place, Vitello's. To many of us, this case against Robert Blake may not have been a finding of innocence. It was a finding of not guilty. This was a case where reasonable doubt lived and this is the standard by which the American justice system works. The theory of Bonnie Lee's murder was that Robert was the man who pulled the trigger, not that he aided, abetted, contracted, and conspired with anyone else. Maybe the jury got confused, or maybe the prosecution was confused. It had to be one or the other. From what I could see, the prosecution was throwing a number of theories out there and decided to see what would stick. But none of their evidence pointed at either theory more strongly than the other. The jury foreman, after the verdict, said that they could not put the gun in Robert Blake's hands. There were some very serious problems with the lack of forensic evidence in this case. An old World War II relic of a gun that leaks massive amounts of gunshot residue should have left copious amounts of residue on Robert. But minutes after the shooting, there was very, very minimal amounts found on his person. This was the reasonable doubt. Some trial watchers would attribute the not guilty verdict to the unpleasantness of the victim, Bonnie Lee which is the basis of this episode. The defense was able to shift the focus of Bonnie Lee's murder from a whodunit to a why was it done to her? Because of her objectionable past? Because of her underhanded dealings and criminal activities? Generally, most people seem to think Robert had something to do with Bonnie Lee's murder. The discussion quickly focuses on her character flaws and the multitude of reasons why Robert had to dislike her. Robert was able to find a significant level of sympathy from people who saw him as the real victim, not Bonnie Lee. And I take issue with that, as Bonnie Lee was the one who ended up with the bullet in her head. People will look to Robert's concern for the child he fathered with Bonnie and they are won over. If he did do it, he did it for a, quote, good reason, unquote. I can't even wrap my mind around this kind of logic. I've said it a number of times throughout this episode. Nothing, nothing, nothing Bonnie Lee did in her life warranted this to have happened to her. And if Robert was the one who pulled the trigger or set in motion the events that led to Bonnie's murder, then it was the duty of the LAPD, the district attorney, the prosecutors, and the state of California to see to it that Robert Blake be held accountable for her death 
and they failed. I can accept that, but I cannot accept that Bonnie Lee should be held to any degree of responsibility for her own murder. Bonnie Lee's three oldest children launched a civil liability case against Robert Blake following his acquittal in the criminal case, asserting that he was responsible for their mother's death. On November 18, 2005, a jury found Robert Blake liable for the wrongful death of his wife, and he was ordered to pay $30 million. Two months later, Robert filed for bankruptcy, and a year later filed an appeal in the verdict in his civil liability case. For the appeal, witnesses testified that associates of Christian Brando could have been responsible for the murder of Bonnie Lee. It had been a defense theory of who may have been involved in the conspiracy to kill her that was laid out in a defense motion filed during the criminal trial proceedings. In 2008, an appeals court upheld the civil case verdict but cut the penalty in half to 15 million instead of 30. I read an article recently that made an interesting comparison between the Robert Blake case and the Scott Peterson case. You guys might remember Scott Peterson, right? I can't even speak that man's name without feeling myself fill with anger and sadness over that case. He was charged convicted and sentenced to death for the killing of his wife, Lacey, and their unborn son, Connor. In fact, Peterson was sentenced to die for the killing of his wife and son one day before Robert Blake's jury returned their not guilty verdict on March 15, 2005. The article compared the two cases against the defendants as having extremely minimal forensic evidence against both men. Just as in Robert Blake's murder case, there was virtually no forensic evidence suggesting Scott had anything to do with Lacey's disappearance and murder. There was no DNA, no blood, no hairs with the exception of one hair belonging to Lacey on a pair of pliers on Peterson's boat. No fibers, no evidence of a struggle or a murder anywhere. But where Robert's jury was able to acquit him due to the lack of forensic evidence, Peterson's jury was able to convict him with the complete lack of physical evidence tying him to Lacey's murder as well. How is this possible? Investigators don't even know how Lacey was killed, but they know exactly how Bonnie was killed. Peterson's case could have been just as much of a reasonable doubt case as Robert's, but there is one glaring difference when you work out the equations of their respective murder cases. The victim, Scott's wife, a lovely young woman from Modesto, California, a cheerleader in junior high school and in high school, an excellent student at Cal Poly State University where she majored in ornamental horticulture. She met and married Scott and dreamed of someday becoming a mom. When she disappeared on Christmas Eve of 2002, she was eight months pregnant with the couple's first child. We all know what happened in the days, months, and years following Lacey's disappearance, so I won't even get into all of that here today. But we do know that almost all of us felt in our minds and in our hearts that her husband did this. So when he was convicted, it was of no surprise. He was sentenced to death and sent off to San Quentin's death row to be forgotten. We were satisfied with that, for the most part anyway. Whether you're a proponent of the death penalty or not, we were collectively relieved that justice had been gotten for Lacey and Connor, right? But this would not be for Bonnie Lee, or her children, or family. She was the grifter. She was the person who spent her life swindling people out of their money. She was exploiting poor old Robert Blake for his fame and his wealth. Along with the baby she tried to claim 
at first was Christian Brando's, in an effort to exploit his family's name. The jury didn't like her. They liked Robert. And suddenly, reasonable doubt meant something different for his jury than it did for the jury that heard Peterson's case. Over there, they liked Lacey, and they loathed Scott. And there lies the difference when it comes to our perceptions of victims. Bonnie Lee deserved justice, just as much as Lacey did. But sadly, it was not going to play out that way. When you look at pictures of Bonnie and Robert's daughter, baby Rosie, you can see how much she looked like her mom. And like her mom, she became another forgotten victim in this whole ordeal. I wonder how much of this Rosie has grown up to know about. Has she read all the things that have been written about her mother? I wonder what her family has told her about her parents. In July of 2002, Robert's older daughter, Delina, a psychology teacher, won permanent custody of her two-year-old half-sister. She was granted temporary custody in May following her father's arrest in April for Bonnie's murder. And today, the now 17-year-old is living a very private life with her, her husband, and their daughter. From the very little I can find about Rosie now, she's attending private school and the school is apparently less than a mile away from the location where her mother was gunned down 16 years ago. Today, as it stands, Bonnie Lee's murder is officially unsolved. Thank you so very much for joining me on this long and complicated episode of California Dreaming, the tale of the victim blame game. I would like to acknowledge the overwhelmingly positive feedback I received last week in part one when I spoke about my experience with my friend's daughter being hit by that truck in the store parking lot. It was traumatic to have gone through that, especially for my friend's daughter and her other children and her husband and all of us who were there by her side during that time as her little girl was healing. I want to thank all of you who took the time to reach out and thanked me for sharing that with you. I'm so moved that you all were so moved by the story. And that was not my initial intention. I wanted to put it out there that I'm guilty of blaming and sitting in judgment of others. And that I've made an effort to be better about it. Because I know I'm in no place to sit in judgment of others. Thinking back upon the Bonnie Lee Bakley murder trial, I can recall myself judging her back then, not really absorbing the severity of the case at hand, not appreciating what it meant when the fans of Robert Blake publicly celebrated his acquittal. Maybe I was too naive or ignorant to get what message was being sent with that. The idea that the only victims that deserve justice are the Lacey Petersons of the world. That somehow the Bonnie Lees mattered less. I hate that I may have been in that mindset and didn't even realize it. It's probably the biggest impact podcasts have had on me. How I perceive certain cases and the people involved in them. There have been some very, very powerful show episodes out this week that absolutely moved me to tears when I think of those victims in those cases. Most notably, Already Gone's episode on the Emily Doe Stanford University rape case and Thin Air's episode covering the disappearance of Jose Ricardo Garay. If you haven't listened to those two episodes, I would highly recommend that you add them to your playlist. You will get a good look at two victims. Well, make that one survivor and one victim who are marginalized in their respective cases in different ways. 
and how unfair justice can often be. You can find California Dreaming on Facebook at the California Dreaming page. You can follow me on Twitter at California Pod and on Instagram at California Dreaming Pod. You can also email me at CaliforniaPod at yahoo.com with any questions or show suggestions. I'd also like to take the time to remind you of the August campaign of Two Pods a Day that I'm taking part in. It aims to introduce podcast listeners to two independent podcasts every day for the month of August. We hope to give visibility to some of the great indie podcasts that you probably haven't heard of. Two Pods a Day encourages you to listen more, listen indie. Find more shows like mine by following Two Pods a Day on Twitter and Facebook. I would also like to tell you about a new podcast I discovered this week. It's called Moms and Murder, a podcast about moms gone bad, with some good motherly advice infused along the way. But I'll let them tell you about it. Hey guys, this is Mandy and Melissa from Moms and Murder, a true crime podcast featuring two moms who think they're funny. Trust us guys, we are. Join us each week as we discuss both the infamous and unfamiliar stories in the world of true crime. You can check us out on our website at momsandmurder.com and also connect with us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. We release new episodes on Tuesdays, so we hope you'll check us out. Thank you again for listening, and until next time, sweet dreams. <laughs>